for coming to Mobile Portland. Um, if you do not have a seat yet, I still think we've got some empty seats, and we've got extra chairs in the back that we can put down. We're sort of holding off to see whether we need them. So if you are sitting next to an empty seat, could you please raise your hand? Ah, so there are some empty seats if people want them. I'm sorry? Front row is open. You can throw things from those seats. Uh, not that I'm suggesting you do that to our speaker, but you have a few more minutes before he gets on stage. You know, it's your last opportunity for me. Um, <laughs> quite possibly, yes. Okay, so, um, got just some brief slides at the beginning, and then we'll let, uh, let Josh take things away. Um, how many of you is this your first Mobile Portland meeting? Please raise your hand. Awesome. So here, here's uh, Mobile Portland. We're about mobile. We meet on the fourth Monday of every month. Why? Because there was an international organization called Mobile Mondays, and we're modeled after that. Uh, but they did not return our emails, so consequently we became Mobile Portland instead. Um, there's a Google group uh, that you can persist or you can subscribe to, and people will continue to have information about that. Um, and there's a Twitter account, um, and there's also a mailing list that you can subscribe to to find out about future meetings. I guarantee that is a low volume mailing list. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, this is our last meeting. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little moment. Um, before we go any further, I want to take this opportunity for anyone who has um, job openings or announcements that they would like to make about events, keep them incredibly brief. Um, and just raise your hand, and Matt Gifford, who has helped organize meetings in the past, will be running around, preferably from side to side, um, and just raise your hand and he'll give you the mic. Good evening, everybody. I'm Thor from Clarity Innovations. We do a lot of work at the uh, intersection of mobile education and technology, and I got four positions open, web app developer, uh, Drupal engineer, Structural designer, content developer, because as you may know, this whole ed tech thing, it's kind of uh, gotten really hot these days. So a lot of people are asking us for help, and I'm looking for more people on the team. Thanks. I saw a hand up here. Hello, my name is Leah Brady. I'm the newly hired user experience director at Viewpoint Software. Uh, bringing in design in-house for the first time. Um, newly built <coughs> Leeds Platinum facility over on Water Avenue, very nice, um, great group of folks uh, going mobile big time, looking to hire two uh, UX designers and a visual designer for now, eventually, um, hopefully we'll get a staff of about 20, but uh, give me a call or look us up online. Mm. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I work at a company called Synapse. We do mass notification systems. We're hiring some mobile developers as well as regular developers in C-sharp.net, and we also have a QA and a tech writer position open, so come talk to me. Thanks. I'm Jesse. I'm a freelance electronics engineer with over a decade in hardware development. I can bring your idea to a product. I'm with Redmark Community Credit Union. Uh, we put the branch in your hands. We're um, hiring two database developers right now. So we have a lot of great upcoming work both in the mobile branch and um, other online opportunities. Is that it? Going once? Going twice? This is your last chance. <laughs> Literally. Ever. All right. My name is Amy Santee, and I'm a user experience researcher, and I am, hello, <laughs> um, I'm looking for uh, mid-level opportunities. I do not do design, just straight up research, and my background is anthropology. Thank you. Oh, see? Last chance everybody wants to get in on it. <laughs> I just really wanted the last word. This is my first one. Um, I'm Katie Delangelo. I work at Copious. We're a digital agency that primarily does uh, e-commerce sites, mobile, and web apps. Uh, we have a few positions open, <coughs> one for a UX designer, one for a technical producer slash program manager, and a senior software developer, I think is the other one. So come talk to me or check us out online. 
All right. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, John, did you make it? Do not see John. All right, so ProFocus um, is a technical uh, staffing organization. So they also help, um, help people with their projects. And um, John and ProFocus have been um, sort of monthly sponsors of Mobile Portland over the last few months. They've been regulars in helping us out. So really, really appreciate their support. Uh, Ramsey, you want to talk about Urban Airship? Ramsey, a.k.a. Dork Gremlin, a.k.a. Uh, chair Organizer. So, um, <laughs> I work here at Urban Airship. We're on the third floor of this building. Um, and I have really enjoyed Mobile Portland and the little bit of time I have to spend with it. Um, and if you have any questions about Urban Airship or what we do, which is pretty much mobile, um, and mobile notifications and mobile messaging, uh, you can feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards, and I'm more than happy to talk about it. Thank you, Ramsey. And uh, Mobile Portland, or um, I'm sorry, Urban Airship has been one of the early um, hosts and regular sponsors of Mobile Portland. Uh, and my company is Cloud4. Uh, we help companies with complex responsive designs um, and responsive applications. And so if you have some of those sorts of projects, we'd love to talk to you. Um, and we've also been helping organize Mobile Portland. And I, I guess my math was wrong. It's seven years, not eight years. And I feel terrible about that. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's nine years, it's almost a decade, according to Rick Tarosi. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, thank you all for making this possible. Uh, I particularly want to thank um, Rob and Elia and Dylan, the board members, Matt, who helped organize it for quite some time, um, Seth, who's recorded, like, I've looked today and there are like 39 videos from this meeting. Um, and they're going to remain on Vimeo, uh, the vast majority of which, like with maybe one or two exceptions, are things that Seth has recorded. Um, the co-founders of Cloud4 and the people of Cloud4 who helped make it happen, um, Ramsey and Urban Airship for hosting and making, us, making it possible to do this. It's, uh, it's really, really been a fantastic run. So if, if you would please join me in a round of applause to thank everybody. Since we announced that we were going to end Mobile Portland, there have been like two questions that people kept asking me. One was why, and um, because it felt like eight years, even if it was seven, is really the answer. Um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of work to organize a, a meeting every month. Um, and it, it seems unlikely that there would ever be like a long-term lifespan of a group around one form factor. Like, we don't have laptop user groups or desktop user groups. And so at some point, Mobile Portland needed to have an end. Um, the second question, and so it's really great to like go out on top as opposed to just having the group wind down. Uh, the second question is, what comes next? And we're not going to stop putting on events. As a matter of fact, we're going to do something different. So um, we announced today that my company, Cloud4, um, all the people there have been working really hard on putting together an event on responsive design. It's going to be a one-day conference here in Portland, um, Responsive Field Day, September 25th. We're going to have it at Washington High School. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but it is not a high school anymore. Um, it is this really fantastic venue that's just been refurbished, and it's got this amazing auditorium. Um, we've got some really exciting speakers that I can't tell you about yet. Um, but that are the sort of people who were, when we received emails back, were like, oh my god, I can't believe they said yes. Um, and so if you're interested, we're, we're not ready to take registration yet, but we did want to tell people, particularly here, that this was going to happen. Um, so you can follow us on Twitter at RFDPDX or um, go to res responsivefieldday.com and sign up and we'll send you emails when the speakers are announced and when the agenda is set up. Uh, one final thing, uh, we're basing it on, on this event in the UK um, called Responsive Day Out. And the really interesting thing about Responsive Day Out is uh, for the last couple of years, the podcast from it has been like a second Christmas for me. I've really, really enjoyed the talks. It's got a very unique format. Um, each speaker, there's, there's, um, each speaker gets 20 minutes. They do three speakers and then they do a panel. And it's an incredibly affordable conference. Um, Jeremy Keith, who organizes the one in the UK, says that um, every expense has been spared. 
Uh, so you can expect that we're going to continue in that vein. It's going to be um, it's going to be affordable. It's going to be diverse. It's going to be inclusive. So really encourage you to keep an eye on this. Um, I wish we had more to share right at the moment, but we're really really excited. This is the thing that's kept our office a buzz, um, especially over the last week as my my coworkers have been working really hard on putting together a really fantastic design. So please go sign up. Um, did you have something? I'm not going to let this meeting go without acknowledging Jason and the announcement and for this group. And I, and I think everybody here needs to acknowledge how awesome that has been for Portland and for us. So thank you. All right, um, we should move on because uh, it's getting dusty in here. Um, so I am so excited. Like we started trying to figure out like how to end Mobile Portland in the most awesome way ever. Like the, the dream that, that we were talking about was we'll just end on the top, we'll have the largest crowd ever, and then we'll drop the mic and get the out of town. And uh, and I cannot think of anyone who would be better at this than Josh. Clark, who I have um, have brought a very very funny photo from some time that we spent in Cape Cod, um, looking at different devices. And Josh is an accomplished author. He has written, um, I think, really a best-selling book and tapworthy. Um, speaks quite a bit on mobile and now speaking on Internet of Things and sort of interaction design around them. For those who of you who are familiar with Couch to 5K, he created Couch to 5K. So his interests aren't just in this space. He is one of the <coughs> nicest people that I know, a phenomenal speaker, and if he screws up tonight, that'll just be the end. Uh, so please, <laughs> join me in welcoming Josh Clark. Jason Grigsby, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's a, it's a real treat to be here, you guys, because um, you know, seven years ago when this thing started, just early on, we were all trying to figure out what the, sort of the new era of, of smartphones meant as the iPhone just kind of just sort of hit the, hit the market and it felt like something new and different. And right from the start, just, you know, out in New York, I had the very sort of strong impression that this group, you know, already was sort of making waves as being a pretty big and smart community right out of the gate. Um, I had the good fortune to be on a panel here, what was it, Jason, three or four years ago now. I'm just like so impressed from the start. So um, really happy to be part of it on the last day. And as we all sort of are, you know, I think one of the things that you were asking about was what comes next. One of them is, you know, whether or not we can actually get our computers to move in here. You know, log into this. All right. Oh, that's sort of an ominous sound, isn't it? Is what's next? You know, I mean, mobile sort of introduced this whole new way of thinking about uh, um, working with digital interfaces, and really, it turned out that this just was kind of the leading edge of a whole series of things that have just come down the pipe. You know, for 30 years, we've been dealing with mouse and keyboard, and one of the things, one of the many things that mobile introduced was this. Uh, uh, was touch, right? It was in sort of this one sort of new kind of first class way to, to deal with uh, digital interfaces that, that uh, mobile really brought about in a big way. But touch was just the first, right? You can feel these things that are nearly mature, speech, connect style, natural gesture, computer vision, you know, facial recognition. You've got passive interfaces, things like Google Now, where they're predicting things with big data before we even know that we want them. All of this is really huge, right? All of these sort of new ways to interact with digital interfaces are, I would say, a change as big and relevant as the shift from desktop to mobile was when this group was getting started seven years ago. So designing physical interfaces for digital experiences. That's the thing that really sort of excites me right now. And as we think about the combination of all these new kinds of ways to interact with digital interfaces, combining things like speech and gesture, for example, you start to get some really interesting things starting to happen. I've got a demo, a speech and gesture 
combination demo that I want to show to you guys to show you how this looks. <laughs> yeah, expecto patronum, you guys. We're talking about spells is what we're doing here. Say a word, make a gesture, and something over there happens. Sort of none of this sort of magic that, that we're starting to be able to create. And not just fantasy or science fiction. This stuff is here right now. We're able to do it right now. I've been studying this demo for some time. And I don't know if you guys noticed, there's this stick that they've been waving around a lot. I looked into it. They call it a magic wand. All right. And it turns out you can get these things on the internet. So you guys, here you go. Look. This is my magic wand. There are many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> And I'm really just, just sort of starting to get the hang of this thing. So I figured I would maybe try it out with you guys. You have to be careful where you wave it, you know, sort of make sure that it's, you know, before something crazy happens. But I thought I would, you know, since it's just a sort of small, intimate group, I feel close to you guys already, sort of try it out a little bit here. So if you're ready, Portlandia Illuminatus. Actually, it takes a little practice. It's like a lot of technology. It's sort of getting the hang of it. Portlandia Illuminatus. Come on! Now, Turnus. Now, Turnus. Now, Turnus. Yeah, say that. New first version sort of uh, technology here. Yeah, I don't know. So, this thing is an infrared remote control with 13 gestures, so I can be at home and like use it to turn my volume up and down. But this is sort of the kind of thing that we're starting to get to where we can just sort of point at something and make it happen, rather than, you know, have my fancy Internet of Things control through my phone or through my screen. We can create the illusion of direct interaction with the world around us using kind of embedded technologies, right? Where we can essentially, you know, magic wands are these things that let us project content or media at a distance through speech and natural gesture. You can affect your physical environment or your home, or your work, or even your body. Just say a word, wave your hands, and something happens. Intent, fluidly transferred to action. Right? And that's, that's sort of what the core of magic is. And it turns out to be very much the kind of stuff that we're able to do now with these emerging digital interfaces. Now, one of the things that I think it's worth remembering is that Steve Jobs famously said of tablets that if you use a stylus, you've blown it. Right? So let's, let's put this down and take a look at what this starts to look like without a magic wand. So this is my friend Aral Balkan. He looks a little bit tired here. He's just come at the end of a 24-hour of a hackathon. You guys know what I'm talking about. He brings some, some gear and some code snippets, and if all goes well after 24 hours of hacking, you've got something to show. He's done this the right way, though. I don't know if you noticed these wine bottles here. <laughs> He's on a yacht in the, off the French Riviera. There's this hackathon called The Boat That Hacks. So if you're going to do a hackathon, follow this guy. He knows what's up. So what he did to, for this was he brought a Kinect, a projector, his laptop, and his phone. And this is the hack that he put together. So you're sitting at home on your sofa, watching television, and something interesting comes on. And you want to share it, say tweet it. So um, I walk up to my TV, and I just kind of wave at it so it knows I'm there. Um, and then when something interesting comes up, I can just grab it and boom. Wait, no, what? Uh, <laughs> grab it and boom. Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. And that's my habit. And you guys, I want to be clear. He did this overnight drinking wine on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Something's going on here, right? Because it's like, I don't want to take anything away from Raw. He's crafty. He's fast. But if he was able to do this overnight drinking wine on a boat, there's something secret to this. There's something that's maybe easier than it looks. And really, it's just he took these things that are just lying around the house. This Xbox Connect from his living room, the laptop he uses every day, the phone that's in his pocket every day. And he put them together in this sort of just novel combination. Really simple interactions. He taught the Connect this. Take a screenshot. And then, you know, you can walk around like you've got it in your hands. But it's probably already on the phone by now. Hmm. Touch to release. Two super simple interactions that, you know, they're sort of core to the operation of both devices, but simply by putting them together, you have something that's really easy. 
So this talk is about how we can use these common technologies, the phones we carry in our pockets and handbags every day, the sensors that are embedded in our homes and our living rooms that we wear on our bodies, to create new and frankly better digital experiences, magical user experiences. So friends, I've got a little performance in three acts here. And the first is looking at this relationship of magic and technology. Why magic is so important to product design and interaction design and why it's always been sort of a powerful influence for technologists, and I think its role for inspiration now. The second is looking at this opportunity for creating these physical interfaces for digital APIs, and why it's relevant and important to all of us, even if you don't think of yourself as an Internet of Things person or a hardware hacker. This is really relevant to anybody who's in business right now. And the third act here that we're going to look at is, is just how do we do this? How do we start to conceive these kinds of magical interactions and products, and frankly, what are the values that we should be embedding in those things? So <clears throat> this is what I do for a living. I help companies and clients imagine and design and build these, sort of, frankly, you know, sort of amazing but simple products that gets technology out of the way, so it really has this illusion of direct interaction. Uh, my last year has been working with companies, typically big mainstream companies, to create these digital experiences in the physical world, um, working with the so-called Internet of Things, stuff that lets you, you know, command unseen forces, your digital life, with a gesture or a word or a dead simple direct interaction. Fortunately, I'm not allowed to share a lot of the stuff that I've been working on, but I do have lots of other examples to show. Friends, many will abuse and delight. Others will alarm and confound. <laughs> so I hope all of them will kind of get you thinking about what's next, not only for technology broadly, but frankly for you and your companies and your practice as designers and developers. So I want to start with Act 1, Magic and Technology. I'm going to start with a quote that you've almost certainly heard from science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, which is that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The design community constantly co-ops the language of magic and delight. You know, without actually delivering the wonder that those words imply, we well, just create a delightful experience with our, you know, financial services intranet. <laughs> it's going to be delightful. You know, it's like I think that we can kind of up the up the bar a little bit by what we mean by both magic and delight. Why don't we deliver the magic that technology promises? That's what we're going to be looking at here. But I'd like to share another somewhat similar quote from you, this one from an actual technologist, Alan Kay, who ran Xerox Park in the, in the 80s, responsible for the creation of the graphical user interface. This is something he said in 1982, two years before the Mac, that you know, fantasy fulfills a need for a simpler, more controllable world. And by that, he frankly meant, let's remove the technology, let's keep, keep people thinking from thinking about the technology so they can and create this illusion, this simple illusion that, that things work in a more direct sense. And this is, of course, what he meant at the time. Let's get rid of the command line and let people point at cute pictures. And this is what fantasy and magic looked like back in 1984, um, where punch cards had given away to, to language, the command line, and now finally the command line was giving way to pointing at pictures like this. You know, pointing has since given way to actually touching the screen, the illusion that we're touching the content itself. And now we have this opportunity to actually point at something in the physical world, manipulate something in the physical world, and have that, its digital representation, change, right? So maybe this is the next logical step after the mouse and the touch screen. Point at what I want, just like Kay's mouse pointer, only now I can use it to point at real things instead of digital abstractions. So, I know you're wondering, where do you guys, where can I get my magic wand? And you know, you might be thinking that you have to go to a place like this, <laughs> with all these personalization options. You know, choose from your many different models of wands. Uh, but you know, it turns out that you don't have to go to a store like this, and in fact you probably already have your magic wand. It's just the shelf that you went to didn't look so much like this, as it looked like this. And your phone or your tablet, that's your magic talisman. Let's say the phone is magic 1.0 for this world. This is a very personal totem that channels you know, the unseen forces around you. And it can become anything, right? 
It's this glass slab waiting for your interface to be applied to it. And we etch these digital interfaces onto these slabs of glass and carry them out into the world. It's the bridge between the physical and digital worlds. And another way to put this, I would say, is that the phone is actually the first Internet of Things device for everyone. And, well, Josh, now you're talking crazy. I know about the Internet of Things. That's about bracelets that text you when you've got bad BO or <laughs> singing refrigerators or something like that. Right? But by Internet of Things, I simply mean it's an everyday object embedded with sensors and smarts and connectivity. And the phone, I would say, was the first everyday physical device to get imbued with those things. The sensors, I would say, are the really new and revolutionary bit. The smartphone is the device that made sensor-based computing an everyday phenomenon, interaction with the world around us, not just through a keyboard. In addition to sensors, the thing that also made it so revolutionary, of course, is the fact that it's mobile, that you could do things suddenly at the point of inspiration. Incredibly powerful, because wherever you are, you can get information or media or services or commerce. And that was brand new just a few years ago. It's amazing how quickly we've become accustomed to it. I did some research, and it turns out that where you, know, where you can find this point of inspiration, it's, a, it's here in Wyoming. It's, a, it's an inspiration point right there. So now, let's say that you're here at inspiration point, and you've got some noisy neighbors, they start playing a song. And you can call up Shazam to identify it, right? So then you can tell your phone to never play that goddamn song again. <laughs> but remember the first time you used Shazam? I mean, that was like really a magical experience. It's like, wow, that's crazy. So using the microphone, I'd say the camera has been especially powerful in terms of this, uh, getting accustomed to using our phones to, to work magic. Um, this is uh, uh, WordLens, which has since been embedded into Google Translate. And how it works is you just point the, the, the camera at a sign in one language, and it translates it in real time, no internet connection, into another, so you never accidentally order the tongue of the tripe again. <laughs> or hopefully you might be able to avoid some potentially embarrassing situations. <laughs> but here, I mean, essentially both of these examples are really using sensors as input to save me effort. Right? I mean, I could just type this into Google Translate, except I don't have to type in unfamiliar words. It just sort of absorbs what's happening around me in this case, and translates it for me, doing this magic and actually changing the image for me. Or with Shazam, just let me listen, I'll tell you what's on it. So there's sort of this minimizing input and maximizing output that's happening there, saving effort. And on that note, I mean, one of the things about this particular magic of phones is that it means that it's also letting us carry less stuff with us, saving us effort to happen, right? So it's been a long time since most of us have carried a point-and-shoot camera or one of these maps or that we wake up with a traditional alarm clock. The phone has destroyed all these sort of categories of products, but it's also creating new ones. It's the first mainstream Internet of Things device. It's also the parent of this generation to come. It's giving birth to these entire product categories. And I think it's a, a big reason for that is that mobile phones are bringing computer power to immobile objects. Because phones are so commonplace, product designers can often assume that there's always a powerful networked computer nearby. So if you put a sensor in something, your phone can start to control it or get data from it. And suddenly we're seeing innovation in things that are decidedly immobile, traditionally dumb, things like locks and light bulbs and garage door openers. And now we're making them smart. And it's not just necessarily by having kind of proximity to phones, but now we can embed those smartphone brains in just about anything. Sensors, <coughs> processors, network connectivity. It's all become so trivially inexpensive that we can embed them in just about anything. And that's what we're seeing right now. That's what the Internet of Things is about, right? Sensors and connectivity and regular everyday objects where everything is a client and everything is a sensor. Everything is a controller. Like, I don't know, maybe diapers. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the nappy notifier from Huggies. You insert this little sensor into the diaper and it detects wetness. And since it knows what your diaper stock is, it can also order for you 
to keep you knee deep in diapers, which is better than being knee deep in something else. <laughs> so the world is becoming this digital canvas, right? Where, and as we'll see, that's I think super relevant to all of us. We tend to think of it as sort of emerging internet of things as these little sort of personal devices and gadgets. But I think it's really much bigger than that. Uh, but I think it's also changing the way that we need to approach our work as designers and developers. <laughs> The interactions that we've seen so far are just kind of baby steps in those. They all require the phone to be a magic lens into this world. And what that means is the phone has not only the power in that kind of relationship, but also all of our attention. So we're embedding sensors everywhere. Most popularly onto our bodies, but this experience is kind of mediated through screens. So this Apple ad, you know, understandably emphasizes the phone. But I think it's capturing an accurate dynamic that the more we try to use technology to build a stronger tie to the physical world or even to our physical bodies ourselves, the more we shove a screen in between us and the world. So Apple likes to say, oh, you're more powerful than you think with this thing, and that's true. But we're also somehow more separated from that power, that relationship to the, to the physical world. Yep. Phones wedge themselves between us and our surroundings. So even in traditionally social situations, we're heads down on our screens, isolated from the people we love, from the places that we care about. And here's a little fact for you. Average smartphone screen time, we're spending over three hours per day, over 20% of our waking hours, looking at phone screens. On average, referencing the phone screen 221 times a day. So even when we're able to put them around, put them away, it turns out they're still bouncing around in our brain. So a study recently showed that people's performance on basic tests of attention gets worse if a cell phone is simply visible nearby. <laughs> I can't concentrate anymore. What's going on? Like the FOMO overtakes us, right? <coughs> so the more connected we are, the more disconnected we are. I mean, so I think that one of the things for the people in this room, you know, we're here. This is from mobile Portland. We're making these mobile products. I would say we've done our job too well. We've sort of focused on creating these engaging experiences, so much so that they are engaging us sort of to the, to the exclusion of, I don't know what's going on here. This is the thing that's plugged in. It's on my screen. Let's see what happens. All right. What am I saying? Good. Suck me in screens, right? Isn't that my message? Well, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can sort of work on that. But so, you know, I think that one of the, the things that we're supposed to be trying to do is actually not make engaging experiences with the screen, but actually help people with their lives, right? So I would say that one of the things that we should be doing, in, uh, one of our obligations, is frankly to sort of start to reverse some of the damage that we've been doing as mobile designers and developers, but still try to deliver some of the value that we deliver through the amazing applications that we create, but also maybe help people reconnect a little bit more with the world around them. Exactly. I think that that's one of the sort of exciting possibilities of designing for the Internet of Things, is that we can actually start to move interactions off the screen and into the environment around us. All right. So one of the opportunities there, I think, is to start thinking about maybe the, it's not so much about focusing on that being available at the point of inspiration. Because the point of inspiration is the point. That's not the moment you want to say, oh, what an inspiring thing. Let me reference this on my phone. <laughs> Let me take a picture of it. Right? Maybe the more important thing is to actually have an interaction with that thing, is to draw you more into that. How can we push those same digital interactions off our pocket computers and into the objects and places that inspire us? Neiman Marcus just installed this mirror at some stores. They call it the memory mirror because it holds on to your image. So after you do a little spin, you can see your outfit in 360 degrees. The dressing room instant replay. Which also means that you can compare your current outfit to the one that you tried on a minute ago. Or even better, the mirror can show you your dress in a variety of colors. And then you can take those mirror memories and share them with your friends to ask their advice. There you go. Oh, let me share that thing right out. So instead of sort of like doing the thing that's, that's, that you'll, if you're involved in retail, you know, it's a really big sort of dressing room activity, 
of you know, taking pictures and sort of sharing, you can actually do that with the image itself that's in front of you, that the mirror itself becomes not only the point of inspiration, but the point of interaction. And I don't know if you guys know this, but until very recently, this technology was only available to evil stepmother queens. <laughs> I kind of think that we should be raiding the evil queen's castle for ideas. We have centuries-long fascination with magic objects. What if magic could bring these things to life to make us smarter, or stronger, or live longer, or sometimes just help us with the mundane details of our life? What if objects could talk to us and share what they've seen and share what they know? You know the sorting hat from Harry Potter. Mm. Difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind, either. So we have this mind-reading wearable <laughs> that knows you better than you know yourself, that can make decisions you don't know how to make. It's Google Now in hat form. Right? <laughs> or maybe you, know, you probably remember this one, right? Household tools that are just smart enough to help us do the dumb, dumb stuff that we've got to do. It's a Roomba for the medieval era, right? <laughs> So I'm not the only one thinking this way. I would highly recommend this book from David Rose of MIT's Media Lab, who wrote this lovely book uh, late last year called Enchanted Objects, about exactly this idea, that we have centuries of inspiration and experience and education imagining what objects could do for us if only they were smarter or more magical. We know how a magic mirror is supposed to operate. We know what a magic wand does. We've been telling each other these stories for centuries. We don't have to invent new user experience, can't we take some inspiration from these, this history of magic objects? So the mirror is one example of interaction with the point of inspiration. What else can magic teach us? Come on, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. There's no so her magic shoes, right, her ruby slippers, give her the power to escape. And so the Dorothy Project imagines the same thing, using your shoes as a magic escape method. Going on a first date? Select receive a cord, create a fake contact, and slip a ruby in your shoe. Now, when things get unbearable, click your heels together three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, my boss is calling. I've got to take this. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll see you on Tinder. I love you. What's <laughs> that to love? All right, so more recently than The Wizard of Oz, though, you guys remember this one. Staples imagine another magic object for both escape and I would say creation too. Remember this one? So N equals what? Josh. <laughs> Today we'll be performing a triple hop over the procedure. But he's never done that before. That's okay. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if there was an easy button for life? Now there's one for your business. Staples, that was easy. I feel like I had that doctor. It sort of still kills me right back from that one. But so, I mean, the thing is, wouldn't it be nice to have an easy button for your life? We're actually seeing, you know, several startups actually pursuing that very idea. This is exactly what button does, bt.tn. You push this button and it triggers this cascade of things for you. Wake up and hit the button to turn on your light, start some music, and start the coffee. Or put it by your door to call a taxi or an Uber on your way out. Or send text messages to your family when you're, when you're home. Flick is a similar device. Just this little single action Bluetooth button that sends a signal to if this, then that. It's an incredibly useful service for experimenting with magical interfaces. If you're not familiar with it, I suspect many of you are, but simply it just takes a ton of available digital APIs for Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or Slack or your home's lights or stereo or security system, anything really. And then you get, can specify a trigger. It could be something like you get a reply from Twitter or, or an email from your mom, and then it triggers a series of actions. Flash my lights blue after I get a Twitter message. Uh, Zapier is a similar service. You know, get to know these, they're awesome. They make it super easy to translate a physical interaction into a digital response. A great way to prototype some of these magical interactions. But that's, that's basically the act one that I wanted to talk to you about, this relationship between magic and technology and the way that we can and always have used it as inspiration for, for new technologies. 
The idea of this is like, how can we make the computer, the technology, as invisible as possible? So it's really about me and the content, me and the thing I'm trying to affect. And it really is about that point of inspiration. Mobile revealed how powerful it was to have access to information at the point of inspiration. But what happens if that actually is the point of interaction, that point of inspiration? by embedding smarts, the smarts of the, of, the, of the mobile phone into these objects, and then using these sort of centuries of UX ideas that we have through myth and legend of how this stuff is supposed to work to inform what we can do now that we've made these objects magic. All right, let's move on to act two. Physical meets digital. You know, mobile was all about making the digital physical. As I said, etching these interfaces onto these glass slabs that we take out into the world to interact with the physical world. And these examples are showing us, though, that, that physical is becoming digital, too. Physical objects can trigger digital actions and vice versa, that these worlds are blended. So really what I'm talking about is we're putting these sort of physical interactions, combining them with digital APIs. So far, all of us, for the most part, have been attaching our digital APIs only to screens, pixels and bytes have always traveled together so far. And suddenly we have the opportunity to tie bytes to the world, to atoms, to make the physical world the interface for these digital APIs. Blending these bytes and atoms means that we can merge digital representations with the things that they're meant to represent. You know, usually there's been an abstraction. We can create this illusion, though, that we're affecting these physical objects directly. In other words, the, the world is the interface. Of course, it's always been our interface. The opportunity is to sort of return digital interactions to the human environment. But also, it means that we can unlock the data trapped in physical objects. I mean, you know this problem really well just by going shopping. And you go to the store, I don't know, you go looking at sweaters. And it's great, you know, that's one of the great things about going to a physical store. You can feel the object, see what it's like, understand what it's made of and, and, and what it's going to be like to, to wear it. But locked up in that object is all this data that you don't have access to. The reviews, whether other people like it, where it was made, who made it, how those people are treated, how well they're paid. All this sort of data and information is locked up in the physical object. How can we start to bring all these advantages of online commerce into the physical world? Sort of, you know, sort of restore interaction with the physical world. And this means that there's much more to this than Kickstarter projects or, 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 or relatively straightforward hardware startups. It's about making more than fitness trackers or wearables or baubles for the rich. This isn't about novelties. This is, I would say, relevant to, to every business and every service. And I think that there are four ways to think about this new physical interface. And the first is, is that it's the world is a data source. As we think about the world as an interface, the first thing is that's, that I think has become really exciting and, and a, a, approachable now is this idea that the world is a data source, this, this so-called ambient intelligence. These are interfaces that listen and try to add value through big data. So you've got progressive insurance with their snapshot sensor. It plugs into the standard data port. It's been on every car since 1996. Your car has an API, every car has for the last 20 years. So this turns it into this talking, communicating, complaining car. Right? Progressive uses this to make insurance premiums tied to your driving habits. So you can make the world a passive interface in this way, something that gathers data to optimize business process and costs in this case, right? to give transparency to customers about why they pay what they pay. And that's passive, and that's just fine. You can also, though, use that data in a way that's maybe more directly advisory. So Automatic does that. It uses a very similar sensor for your car to deliver a very different service. Automatic, in this case, is focused on delivering um, actionable advice or insight to the driver. So you plug in the sensor, and it syncs with your car. And the goals here are to reduce environmental impact and improve safety. So it watches how you drive, it takes notes when you accelerate quickly or brake quickly, and it gives you this feedback. And they've got a pro program specifically aimed at teens and new drivers, so sort of a driving approach there. But it doesn't just watch you, it watches the car. 
who can decipher what the dashboard means, suggest how to fix it, and let you dismiss the alert yourself. Right? It's like a magic translator for your car. It empowers you. Progressive uses theirs to give the company insight, and that's fine. Automatic uses it to give the driver insight. I think it's sort of like when you start to think about that not just at the individual level, but grow that into a larger system, then it's something that we can actually do a lot to actually change social behaviors, improve entire cities. A project that I worked on recently is called Asmapolis. They recently changed their name to Propeller Health. And the deal is that it helps, at first, individuals get control of their asthma. So it's this little Bluetooth gizmo that goes on your inhaler. And every time you take a puff, it sort of takes note of the time and the location. And then at the end of the week, you get these, these kind of constantly updating reports to say whether or not your, your asthma is controlled, what you might do to improve it. But also, it, because these things are uh, um, given out through clinics, they have thousands of them in a community, that they can also start to do things from a larger epidemiological point of view, that you know, an hour after people go through this part of town, we see an, uh, an uptick in attacks. That means that we can learn something about what the causes in our community are for asthma, which begins to get the really important stuff. <coughs> yes, it's helpful to me as an individual, but wow, really important to us as a system and as a culture. So again, this is using data to deliver insight and advice. And, and, uh, advice. And these are sort of the new crystal balls. A fortune telling used to be about you know, natural and celestial phenomena. Now it's all about data, right? Now these things, these passive interfaces, might simply gather information to provide insight, the examples we've seen here, or things like Google Now. Or they might listen for problems. You know, dad hasn't taken his medicine, or he's fallen, or his glucose is low. Your basement is flooding. Your posture could be better when you sit up. Sort of the, these things that can be sort of like you know, sort of gentle, nagging reminders. TV that's equipped with an eye tracker, this is a real thing. It knows when you've fallen asleep, so it can start recording the game on the DVR. <laughs> Similar things that are being uh, experimented with in cars to help drivers stay awake and detect if you've got signs that you're falling asleep at the wheel. Uh, so these passive interfaces tend to feed screens, though. Data that's gathered from the physical world pushed back into the virtual world. They're super valuable, but they tend to ignore the most important part of interacting with the physical world. And this is the second thing that I want to talk about in this idea of the world as an interface. That the world is reactive. We leave a wake behind us. So the things we do in the world cause this eddy of reaction that, that follows us. Magical UX creates digital eddies from our actions. And so if our actions are a source of data that can also be a source of control where the world becomes a joystick. You know, that, that, that's the stuff that feels like magic. So an example of that is that for centuries, the military have used these sand tables right, as models of combat zones to get the lay of the land, run sort of simulations in the room. And of course, naturally over time, those move to digital representations, tend to be more flexible than their sand counterparts, but you lose something too, this sort of sense of physicality and, and scale. Uh, the Aries sand table addresses that problem by equipping this plain old sandbox with a projector and a connect camera. So you can project the landscape onto the sand, or as you see here, these elevation lines. Then you can use the connect to read the topography, the shape of the land. And when you move the sand, the digital model updates, and the projection updates too. So the physical and digital are always totally in sync. You can sort of like create these mountains or dig these rivers. The sand is the controller for the digital model. And then you can project your war games or satellite images onto this little landscape. See how troops and vehicles contend with it. You can have the satellite view so you can actually see how soldiers are moving across the terrain in front of you. Uh, so there's this you know, kind of remarkable thing of like, oh, let me actually shape this environment to tie it to the, the digital world. To sort of move from the war room to the dressing room. This is uh, Rebecca Minkoff. She's a designer who's installed these interactive mirrors in the dressing rooms of her boutiques. This is the one in Soho in New York. So the clothes in the boutique have these RFID tags, so the dressing room knows what items you've got inside of it. And the mirror 
updates to show you what you've got. So then you can now ask the mirror to suggest accessories or how to style each item. Or maybe even better, you can use the mirror to ask the clerk for another piece or a new size without leaving out the dressing room half naked and announcing to everybody, I can't fit into the pants. <laughs> you can adjust the lighting in the room. Sort of, you know, if you're you're buying a, an evening gown, you know, you've got you know, sort of the, a sense of how it will look in that light. You can use the mirror to ask the clerk for another, uh, for uh, to to check you out, to gather your things, check out and pay. So you know, the thing that I'm sort of trying to draw a stink, distinction with here is that versus instead of these passive interfaces, we've got these intentional interfaces. You know, they don't just listen, but they sort of extend my will out into the world. Again, at the point of inspiration. And this is some Harry Potter stuff. Right? I make a physical gesture, and there's a physical response. In my automated home, I don't always need the light bulb to be smart. It's actually more magic if it simply listens. This is an area, that, you know, again, where I'm, I'm working fairly extensively. I tend to work with big media companies and wearable companies and home automation companies that need to create products and interactions that effortlessly bridge the, the physical and the digital. Uh, and so the world in that point is, you know, how can we make it interactive? Not just passively listening, but actually the sort of point of magic interaction. I think that brings me to the, the third point I wanted to make about the idea of the world being the interface. So it's a really big canvas. If you thought designing for mobile and desktop was tough, you know, try designing an interaction for an entire room, or for a city. Let's start with a room. Uh, <laughs> The Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York has these thousands of wallpaper samples in its collection. And of course, it's impossible to display them all, but let alone actually get a sense of what they would look like on the wall. And so their new immersion room lets you browse samples, and it projects them up on a wall, stitching them all together, so you can get a sense of what this wallpaper is actually like, or what it was like in a room. So you can instantly change the entire room, or create your own wallpaper pattern and, and project it. So this is about literally the world being a big canvas, projecting the digital world into the physical. But I think what's especially exciting is that we can also use sensors to interact with an entire space. The thing is, of course, most rooms are pretty dumb, at best fairly mechanical, and seemingly immune to everyday use sometimes, right? Let alone to magic. But what if we can help them a little bit? What if we can just sort of say, hey, room, I want this part of the room to do something new. Yeah, that seems pretty good. I mean, right now, a big focus is on embedding sensors uh, into individual objects or into bracelets that we carry with us. But what if we put aside this idea of wearables and instead focus on variables? Oh man, forgive me for sort of trying to like, put a new one here, but variables are rooms that are smart so that the objects can remain dumb. Um, Jerry Ficklin, uh, of Frog Design, blew this idea out in a project called Room E. Turn on the lights. Turn off this light. Turn off that light. Turn on these lights. Jerry. What he's showing here is that the projector can detect when there's something in the way and move the display out of the way. Let's order takeout. What did I order last time? Order that. Show me the backyard. And here again, even though an image is being displayed, the data will move out of the way and not going to put it in way. Hide the backyard. Goodbye. So the idea of these variables, right, is that the room is smart enough to know what's up. So instead of, you know, a bracelet imperfectly measuring your sleep, let your bed do it. Right? You know, the smarter that you make the environment, the dumber individual objects can be. And that makes the world an even bigger canvas, because you, then you can extend the digital world to more of it. And then the last thing that I want to mention about sort of designing with the, the world itself as an interface is that, you know, you might have heard that the Earth, it turns out, is not flat. Right? But that's what we as pixel designers tend to work with, right? A really strictly two-dimensional experience. 
You know, even for our physical devices, we sort of pretend that they're two-dimensional, even though they have obvious weight and mass and depth. I think that there's a, an opportunity to understand that these themselves are objects, not just screens. Uh, they, they have mass, and our magic has to account for that. Um, Thaw is a project from MIT's Tangible Media Group to make phones and laptops more friendly. So at the start, you know, it's like, great, they're basically replacing a mouse here. Frankly, the mouse is just fine. We probably don't need it to be replaced. But what else could we do with this kind of interaction between devices? Well, this is sort of interesting. Just sort of dragging them in. Now, now actually, well, there's your data transfer. That's sort of better than a thumb drive in some ways. The way it works, by the way, is that it, it, the camera reads a 2D grid on the screen. You can sometimes see it showing up in a little bulge there underneath the corner of the screen. But here we're sort of saying, you know, great, so on the one hand, these are just sort of two flat screens that are going together. But what if we start acknowledging the dimensionality of the phone itself? Oh, that's cute. <laughs> but now it's a physical object. It's not just another screen getting pressed to it. We can sort of take that a step further. What if we sort of took content into one screen, transformed it there, and poured it back into the other screen? <laughs> So on the one hand, it's, it's, it's recognizing, oh, wait a second, these devices should be working better together. But also just the physicality of them is important. This is something that um, uh, I worked on a lot with my buddy Larry Legend. That's his name, you guys, Larry Legend. How awesome is that? He's my studio mate, and we spend just sort of weekends hacking together on things. And we wanted to think more about how can we make the phone and the, the laptop, these things that we use constantly, transferring data together constantly, recognizing the sort of the physical relationship with them. So we have this little project called Happy Together, and here's the deal. Is that Larry is in the studio, listening to music on his headphones. Here he is, listening to music on his headphones. But he gets back to his desk, and he wants to start listening to music on his desktop computer. How does he do it? Yeah! Two taps. Start playing on the other side at the same moment. And look how happy Larry is! <laughs> right? So the thing is, is that you know, we can start to think of these interactions as being physical, that it's not just, oh, I'm interacting with this physical object. The interaction itself should be physical and recognize the physicality of the devices at hand. So that sort of brings to a close this second act, ladies and gentlemen, that I wanted to share with you about the physical and digital stuff, just quickly what we covered here is just this idea that we want to gather data for insight. It's got to be about more than just gathering the data for data. That as we start to think about passive interactions, that we can start to add insight, whether that's business insight or customer insight. And the part of the things that we can do as we start to think about uh, uh, really more intentional interaction beyond passive interaction is that I can actually use it to express my will across the room. Thinking about what the, the, the uh, world can be as a big canvas, both as something that you project the digital world onto, but also as a way that, that the world itself can be a big sensor to understand that intentional interaction, that real magic that we're doing, that dumb things can be smart too, if the room, or that the dumb things can seem to be smart, but remain dumb as long as the room itself is smart. And finally, just thinking about those interactions that have real mass. Now, this is a, a, a big change. All this stuff sounds uh, complicated, right? But it doesn't have to be. The stuff that you, this stuff used to be, just a few years ago, seemingly impossible to build. And the thing is, here's the secret, you guys. Here's how to do it. You can build it with unobtainium. <laughs> this is my secret to you. So engineers in the 50s used this phrase for unusually, unusual or costly materials. It's unobtainium. <laughs> You know, it's theoretically perfect material, if only it actually existed. So it turns out the guts of our everyday technology used to be unobtainium. Stuff used to be military-grade industrial technology, right? And now you can get it at any Walmart. And you want to make a connected door lock, a camera collar for your dog, or you need an eye tracker? But the electronic components are all there, more or less off the shelf. They're pretty cheap. So unobtainium is finally here, and it turns out it's cheap. The ideas that you might have cast away just five years ago as impossible, as, as, as impractical, 
are not only possible, but often it turns out trivially inexpensive, kind of ready to plug right in. So in a lot of ways, in that respect, it's all these sort of component hardware parts. Hardware isn't the barrier. Actually, software is the hard part. It's the, the services that you build into this, the interactions that you build on top of it. And I think that's what a lot of the folks in this room are already really good at. So at least start using the software tools available to you. And start thinking about my friend Aral, who built that hack, you guys, overnight, drinking wine on a boat. And realize, you know what, it's not a challenge of technology as we do this stuff. It's a challenge of imagination. How can we put these things together in truly new ways? Because we're awash in the technology to do this. It's really about how can we combine them in new ways. This isn't about inventing the stuff in the lab. It's about using the stuff that's sitting in front of us. So that's what I want to talk about to sort of close out here. Is, is, is how do we imagine this magic? And of course, naturally, what I'd like to do uh, to get started with that is to start with Google Glass. Alas, <laughs> Google Glass is defunct, rest in peace, and it never really got out of the prototype stage. Um, and I think there are several reasons that it, it never caught on, but I, I'd like to focus on one of them, which is, from the outside at least, it always looked like an engineering project. Hey, I've got cameras and memory and processors, let's see what it's like when I strap them to your face, <laughs> right? starting with the technology instead of sort of the human need. We have this technology, how can I put it on your face? <laughs> and I think that the better question would have been, you know, what if this thing was magic? What if these glasses were magic? You know, going back to this idea of, of looking at the tropes of myth and legend, you know, there's this rich vein of stories about magic vision. You know, Google might have started there. Just a, an exercise that I often do with clients just to sort of kickstart this project process is to think about you know, a really sort of just mundane object, something like a coffee cup. You know, if we were going to wire this up for digital interaction, let's first ask, what if this were magic? <laughs> you know, in, in the implicit in that question are questions of context. What is this cup witness to? What actions is it adjacent to? You know, this is the first thing that I see every day as I greet the day. Or this is the thing that's between me and you as we meet for coffee to share ideas or life experiences. Or this is the thing that's with me late at night as I'm working on a deadline, trying to stay awake and alert. Yeah. And then once you've sort of got those emotional contexts and those, those, those actual sort of the things that it's witnessed to, the actions it's adjacent to, then what, what might it be able to do? Can it talk? Can it listen? Does it have brothers and sisters? Is it annoying or is it gentle? And then sort of these use cases sort of start to come out. Don't worry about yet how to do it. Because that stuff is already working itself out really quickly, getting cheaper and smaller all the time. But the, the crucial bit, the imagination, starts not with the technology, important as it is, but in the, what, the question, what is it magic? You know, what if it was magic? And that really means sort of designing for the things, essential thingness. You know, in this case, you're trying to make it a coffee cup but more so, you know, more in tune with not just its function, but its context. So the goal is not necessarily to turn it into something else, and the goal is not even to make things talk. <coughs> the goal is to improve the conversation. I don't want a smart home. I don't want home automation. That's not my goal. My goal as the person who lives in my home is simply to let the things in my home do their jobs better. Maybe by understanding the digital environment that they now live in. That point, in other words, we should bend technology to our lives, not the reverse, make things more like they are, so we can make us more human, not more like the machines. And that's the crux of magic, right? In Harry Potter, Hermione's beaded bag, is magic because it's bigger on the inside. Bag of holding, right, nerds? You guys know what I'm talking about. It can hold an impossible quantity. So it's magic makes it more of a bag. It's enhancing its essential role. Uh, I had the sort of unusual opportunity to go to Dubai recently, and I went to the top of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. It's the one that Tom Cruise climbed in Mission Impossible, right? And they've got these sort of magic viewfinders for looking at the surrounding view. And of course, you, you look at the screen, you point it at what you want to look at, and of course, you can see what's out there right now. But with a couple of buttons, you can see what it looks like at night, or if it's at night, what it looks like during the day. Or you can look at what it looked like 50 years ago before Dubai existed. 
little time travel feature that they've got in there. So it's this magic viewfinder for looking at the surrounding view. They've made it this magic lens for a magical view. Uh, color up is this lamp that changes color. And the way that you go, you sort of give it a little squeeze and it changes color on to whatever it's sitting on top of. You know, why not let it slurp up that color directly from the environment? Deceptively easy, right? Squeeze the light, absorb the color. Sort of similar kind of idea of, along these lines is Samsung's induction stove. So it, like many of you may, may know about induction stoves, un unlike a typical electric stove, they don't get red, right? There's no heating element, it's just an electrical current. There's no vin visual indication that it's hot at all, let alone how hot it is. So Samsung has set out of these LEDs as virtual flames to show how hot it is. It has nothing to do with how hot it is. Like, you know, the, the color there, it has nothing to do with heating the, the pan, but it rhymes with our mental map for how heat and light work. So with all these sort of examples, what I'm really getting at is, man, lie to people. <laughs> all of these examples lie about how they work. They create this mental model that is far simpler than what's really going on. Remember what Alan Kay said at the beginning? Fantasy helps us create a simpler view of how things work. We do this all the time. Hello, American political system. <laughs> but you know, it's like, the, the point to remember is that all user interface is illusion. This thin layer of magic over this churn of ones and zeros. It's all a lie about trying to help us understand something that frankly we cannot possibly understand. So context-aware experiences have to reflect the lies that we tell ourselves, not the truth, not the hard facts. That's frankly how magic works too, right? Don't look behind the curtain. You know, we're going to sort of ride along with me with this illusion. And that means that part of this means that we have to love the gimmick that we're sort of putting in front of people. Really interesting, turns out that the word gimmick turned out in the 1920s actually referring to a piece of magician's apparatus. It's a show term. And so this is the, basically it's the, the focus of the magic trick in this case, the item through which we understand the magic is happening even though it's often misdirection. Uh, magic depends on that. Of course, it turns out that the word gimmick has evolved to mean something more negative, and indeed some gimmicks aren't necessarily well considered. Um, we did a little thought experiment with the coffee cup earlier. Let's look at another one. Another cup. This one tells you what you've just poured inside it. Upset juice. What's this guy pouring in? Beer! <laughs> so, you know, it's the kind of thing that fits into this um, the quantified cell thing where you can understand how much caffeine you're having, how much hydration you're getting. If it doesn't know, it will just sort of tell you it's a mix, but still will understand what the what the nutrient makeup of it, and you guys, frankly, holy crap, that is an amazing piece of technology, right? I mean, wow, it knows what's going into the thing. It is magic. Um, Stephen Colbert was certainly impressed by it as well. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> A digital cup that can tell me what's in the cup and how many calories and allow me to drink it? <laughs> that level of information was previously available only on the can you just pointed out. <laughs> Think about it, there are so many times when Vessel's beverage identifying technology will come in handy, like when you order a Coke, but it tastes kind of like a Diet Coke, but you're not sure. And perhaps other times. So the thing is, like, on one hand, amazing technology, right? But is it being put to the right use? I mean, sort of being put to sort of that, oh, great, we know what's in it, we can just tell people what's in it. But, you know, to this point, is that really serving anything? And you know, compare that to these smart chopsticks that have been developed by the search engine Baidu in China. You know, these chopsticks measure the freshness of cooking oil and, more generally, the pH levels, calorie, sodium content, and temperature of food, which is relevant because it comes on the heels of all these food scandals in China, where literally uh, um, stores were, like, painting food with stuff to make them look more fresh. You have this sort of glow-in-the-dark pork 
you know, and, and food that's sort of painted in this inedible pigment. And suddenly this is the kind of thing that makes suddenly more sense. You know, how healthy is this thing that I'm having? It's doing more <coughs> than just capturing data. It's getting back to this idea of thinking about what can we do to actually improve people's lives? Why am I sort of giving people more data? How can I add more insight? You know, as we develop these remarkable technologies, you know, how are we sort of actually helping people's lives rather than complicating them? Smart doesn't always mean good, right? You have to deliver a human need. Or otherwise, we start to get things like this, right? This is this big problem for the, for the quantified self, you know, where our life begins to feel like, like these. Well, all those good, good steps, the extra data actually give you actionable steps to make your life better. You know, so the point is, is always like, how do we improve the data signal? And what kind of remarkable insight can we offer instead of just reminding people how shitty their lives are? <laughs> I don't know, what does that look like? You know, the, 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 you know, one thing is, you know, maybe the insight we want to do is who are the healthy people for you to hang out with? This is a heart rate monitor, and this is the People Keeper app. It connects to any heart rate monitor and uses an established data model that lets you use heart rhythm to determine emotional state. Now, I should say this is, this is kind of, this is a real app. And it actually does use this data. It's also kind of a commentary and an art project. But I think it's, it gets at the point that I'm trying People to make. Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out. And it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out, makes you excited, <laughs> sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up. And let People Keeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good and blocking the ones that don't. <laughs> so this is half art project and half legit app, but maybe more than anything, right, it's, it's commentary. You know, it's, it's more commentary on, on what it is that our things ought to be doing, which is how can I actually improve our lives with, with data? I think that's, it raises the question more than offering the answer. Um, so there, there are plenty of, of things like relationships that are places where technology is often left out that if it's sort of kept to the side, but, it, but for giving you useful information, health is obviously a big sort of burgeoning area for that, that we can make a real difference. But I think also so there are some times that you just don't want to meddle too much, right? You don't necessarily need to put technology in between us and the rest of the world, as I was saying earlier another thing that Alan Kay mentioned back in 1982. Sometimes, you know, things are just fine without adding additional technology. You know, connecting a dumb object makes it harder to use with few appreciable benefits. Just leave it alone. Don't let it be its thing. Does a carrot, for example, really benefit from being smart? <laughs> Introducing carrot. Carrot uses an innovative combination of nutrients to provide a seamless experience for your digestive system. Here's how it works. Swipe with two fingers to feel the carrot's rough texture. Pinch carrot with your thumb and forefingers. Then make a lifting motion to lift carrot to your face. It's that easy to get fresh, quality nutrients delivered wirelessly to your body. Carrot works seamlessly with all your favorite apps. And carrot is compatible with a wide variety of sauces and dips. And coming soon, integration with Beats by Dre. Beats! <laughs> carrot uses virtually no power, so you can take your carrot anywhere. When you find a carrot you love, it's easy to share with friends. When you're done with your carrot, swipe upward. Don't worry, your carrot is secure. The carrot will notify you when it's time to update your carrot. <laughs> We've put a lot of work into carrot and can't wait to share it. <laughs> carrot, a simple way to stay alive. All right. You get the point, right? I mean, the, in all of this, it's like this. Our job as technologists is to be as invisible as we can. Let's that's that's make people wade through as the absolute minimum of technology to get to where they're going. Keep it simple. Distract as little as possible. Because right now, our technology is really distracting, constantly vying for our attention. Just, you know, one more thing, just go back, you guys, 
over 30 years, again, to what Alan Kay was saying in 1982, is that the goal is to make the computer disappear. And right now, it's really become all too visible. So as we bathe in more and more of this data, the real luxury, I think, is to enjoy peace and calm, to actually be left alone a little bit. And services should alert us gently, or even subconsciously, to changes in our environment. Uh, cognitive scientists have this idea called uh, pre-attentive processing. And pre-attention is when you're absorbing information without consciously noticing it. So as day changes to night, we feel the temperature change on our skin, and the shift in light. We notice the change gradually, subconsciously, really, until all of a sudden, consciously, we realize it's dark. Right? So let me give you some examples of some interfaces that design for pre-attention in this way. Some software tracks very complex information, financial markets, great example, right? There's tons and tons and tons of data, impossible to sort of track the individual elements. It's really about the motion, sort of the overall motion that you want to, to try to capture. Um, a friend of mine, Adam Bloomston, developed just such a system to try to track something like that. And one of its interfaces is audio. So for example, the sound of regular market activity might be kind of this calm major sound. That's just the sound of the market behaving as it should. But as activity picks up, perhaps you start to hear some rain. Right? Still a background sound, but one that starts to tickle your brain a little. Something's a little unusual. You know, maybe thunder <laughs> indicates the storm of activity. Or maybe things are starting to get a little crazy. Right? Or it's scary. Or hopefully sort of returning to relative calm. Right? So the system is in the background, and it gradually ramps up until it has our attention. Bilbo Baggins knows all about it, you guys. <laughs> this is the very same dynamic that makes Bilbo Baggins a sword so effective in The Hobbit. The sword glows blue when orcs, when the monsters are nearby. It sort of quiet, sits there quietly until it has something to report, glowing faintly when they're far away, and then getting sort of stronger and stronger basically a single pixel display. <laughs> and it banks on free attention, getting your attention at just the appropriate threshold. You know, don't you kind of wish that email alerts were more like that? MailChimp uh, commissioned several hardware experiments from designer and artist Brendan Dawes. Uh, and one of these is used to display the percentage of unread mail. Get this gentle, ambient signal of how much work you have. This kind of thing moves data gently into the background rather than making it a constant nag can weave data into the fabric of the environment rather than imposing it. One more example from this uh, was uh, it shows this notification that might be more gentle too. Notifications are often hard and, and cold and kind of unforgiving. Paper, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. It's sort of soft, warm, and tactile to the touch. Here's a simple, just analog notification for an event that you really care about. You know, this is another kind of single pixel display. It sort of embraces the, the charm and warmth of the analog world. Now, I'll also admit, not only is it sort of charming and warm, but it's also maybe another thing. Ridiculous! <laughs> it's ridiculous, but I think that's okay. And I guess one thing that I would say as we start to design and develop and conceive stuff for this is that it's all right to be just a little bit ridiculous. You know, embrace that and go for it. I think it's important to, to play and splash in the puddles right now to understand what it is that's possible. And be playful to find truly engaging interactions or experiences. Here's a great example of ridiculous. So Sci-Fi aired an awesomely terrible B-movie horror flick called Sharknado. Maybe you've heard of it. Basically, a tornado picks up a pack of man-eating sharks, which ravages Los Angeles and New York, forcing residents to defend themselves with chainsaws. Uh, so they wanted to make the viewing experience as awesomely cheesy as the movie itself. Right. So the, the sci-fi sync app and Philips Hue light bulbs combined, right? so it lets you change color and, and intensity. So your whole room can become part of the viewing experience. Now the Sci-Fi Sync app for iPhone and iPad can connect to your Hue bulbs while you watch Sharknado and Sharknado 2. Your Hue bulbs will change color and intensity to reflect the increasingly stormy weather conditions, chainsaw-induced shark carnage, and more thrilling. <laughs> Ridiculous! <laughs> One more.
Furthermore, why stop there? Mega Stomp Battle is a wearable that adds sound effects to your steps and motion. <laughs> So like this is goofy. It's just flat out silly, right? But you know what else it is? It's this really simple way to associate motion, gesture really, with action and sound. Right? So play is an important kind of experimentation, and it kind of gets us out of our tunnel vision. Toys are fun and they're easy to use and they don't require you to read the manual. And that should be a goal of our interfaces too. And lest you sort of say, well, you know what, I'm serious. I'm going to get fired if I do these sort of silly things. I think it's important to remember that things like this were also completely dismissed in the 1980s by every serious computer user who thought that these were a ridiculous toy for people who didn't understand what real computing is about. I love this line from Benedict Evans. He said that the future of technology has always looked like a pretty toy to people who are comfortable with the past. I think it's sort of understanding, you know what, we as humans like play. We like things to be easier. We like the fantasy that makes things easier to understand. So as long as it actually does still let us accomplish our goals, <coughs> embracing play uh, and some of these ridiculous things are, are useful and hopefully we'll sort of keep our magic stuff out of the magic junk shop. One of the things, though, that I think it's, it's worth understanding is that some of these things are just, frankly, just bad ideas sometimes. Right. I mean, they're just playful, silly things. That's not our goal. Our goal is not to create novelty. We've got bigger problems to solve than making pretend that I'm an 8-bit character. Right? My point is, that can uncover some interesting interactions. But I think it's also important to, to understand that magic you know, lets us down all the time. It always goes wrong. Right? That's an essential truth of all magic and myth. We always know that, that it comes back to bite us sometimes. It right? sucks. <laughs> Close that school down. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. I mean, magic going wrong is, is super familiar to us, and it's certainly familiar for technology. It lets us down all the time. And the, the fear of losing agency to unreliable technology is, is definitely with us as we build it more and more into the fabric of our lives. And I think that's a legitimate fear. You know? At what point do you stop being in control? <laughs> Or does the technology start to make decisions that you don't agree with? You got a real headline a couple weeks ago. Yeah. This woman fell asleep on the floor and her Roomba tried to eat her. <laughs> the human being always has to have access to the off switch, right? Let me use a mechanical light switch if I need to. Don't make me rely on sort of the fancy smartphone digital stuff. My hand on the doorknob should always trump the smart lock, right? So I think part of this means that as we're doing this, you know, I think one of the really important design systems, especially as we start to think about algorithms and stuff, is that the systems have to know when they're not smart enough. You know, we can't re entirely rely on the algorithm. And the point at which they fail is the best time to insert human judgment. So one last example, and we can sort of bring this thing home. <coughs> this is an engraving of, of an automated chess machine from 1770. Real sort of modern wonder of the era. It was this wooden dummy that was operated by gears and flywheels to move chess pieces around the world. They called it the, the mechanical Turk, sometimes just the Turk. And for 50 years, 50 years, it thrilled audiences by beating some of the smartest minds in the world. It beat Napoleon at chess. Ben Franklin would be at chess until it was exposed as a hoax in 1820 because it turns out there's just like a little guy down there. <laughs> right? So the illusion was that the machine was smart and clever and subtle, but of course we didn't have the technology to do it, so we inserted some human intelligence in there. The chess master filled the gap of cleverness that the machine couldn't handle. The machine and the chess master were partners in the illusion here, right? Let's think about these mechanical systems that we're creating, that maybe how they could be supported by humans, and how that's important.
to magic. You know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see a service where I can, on my phone, or maybe even by some gesture, sort of call a self-driving car that just comes right up and just picks me up just like that and whisks me without a word to my destination, my magic carpet. That would be an awesome Internet of Things service. Of course, not possible yet, although, wow, it seems like maybe soon. But, you know, until then, if you put a human in the car, like that chess master and the mechanical Turk, you get Uber, right? Only those guys are jackasses and horrible people. And so let's call Lyft instead, please. <laughs> please, the Lyft your Uber account. They are awful, awful people. All right. Just saying. All right. Either way, what's going on here is we emulate some of the service functions with humans before you can build them in software. So I would argue that Lyft and Uber are Internet of Things services. They're connecting driver and passenger physically in the real world. So I think the most important thing to take from all of this is that the magic is not about the thing. It's not Harry Potter's wand that's magic. It's Harry, right? And the same goes for the Internet of Things. Ultimately, the Internet of Things is not about the, the objects. It's about this combination of, of sensors and intelligence and cloud access. Intelligence acting on that sensor data will be a robot sometimes. But other times, a robot acting on a sensor data <coughs> is you, a human who happens to have that same sensor package, which means that it's not the robots taking over, it's the human beings partnering with the robots. You know, wizards and sorcerers and magicians, they're all just people, but more so, extraordinary. We tend to use words like, oh, enhance, it's like you're going to be enhanced, you're going to be augmented. The sort of thing is like, let's <coughs> amplify our sort of essential Humanity. Technology is neutral, right? It's what we do with it that's important. So I think we should be thinking about how do we design for human connection? Encourage interaction with our surroundings. Make us who we are, but more so. It's sort of design for our essential selfness. If design for things is for the essential thingness. So that's sort of the, the end of this third act, ladies and gentlemen. And just to sort of round out what we're talking about here is the question shouldn't be so much about the technology, but what if this thing was magic? And how can I use it not to just gather data, but to really sort of provide insight? Make the technology as, as invisible as possible so that it's really about me and my surroundings and the people that I care about. It really boils down to making the technology humane, making it about the people, making it human-centered. Because you know, it's not a question of can we do this. We certainly can. Again, it's not a challenge of technology. It's a challenge of imagination. How will we do this? And how at this moment that we're starting to create this new way to interact with digital interfaces, what are the values that we're going to embed in that stuff? So important. Uh, so, you know, I think we don't have to wait to do this stuff, right? The technology is here, and it's accessible right now, you guys. This is one of the most exciting times in the history of technology, maybe in the history of culture. I would say, you know, recognize that you've got the tools already. You don't have to wait. Do it right now. And make something amazing. Thanks, you guys. Are you okay with taking some questions? Oh, no. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Do you get to talk to? Uh, yeah, of course. So uh, raise your hand and Matt will wander around with the microphone. Uh, great talk, thanks. Thank you. Um, as we move away from our black screen devices, black mirror devices, and, and re-engage with the everyday world, um, have you heard of anybody doing work talking about uh, how we, we make that happen when so much of our interactions uh, are, are being monetized. So the, the more capture you can get of somebody's time through the, the device, the, the more money you make. Yeah. So I, mean, I think there are a couple of things there. One is, frankly, the, the interface, right? It doesn't have to be through the screen. Or can businesses realize value through a direct interaction that frankly still lets us go on with our lives? 
But I think, yeah, I mean, this is an essential question that I think is unsettling for a lot of us as we think about uh, interfaces and, 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 and computers and sensors being embedded in the most intimate spaces of our lives and even into our bodies, is who's benefiting from this? I think that a lot of, right now, it's being left purposely vague. Right? So it's kind of like, oh, um, you know, sure, we're mining all of your data. Who's read the Google Terms of Service recently? <laughs> they have the right, um, it's your intellectual property, your email, your documents and everything, but they have an unlimited license to publish it, to perform it even. I swear to God, they can perform your email if they want to. You have given them unlimited right to use your data as they see fit. Wow. You know, it's like, I, I recommend reading it. It's almost like hilariously evil. <laughs> or potential applications. You've given them permission to do unlimited evil with your data. And so I think part of it is, one, giving a shit, you know, which I think that all the people in this room do give a shit, and yet probably haven't read those terms of service, because you kind of don't want to know, right? And we all talk about, the whole nation talks about privacy. Oh, I'm outraged that I'm, you know, I don't have my privacy. But we will give it all up to look at cat photos. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that there's, in, in the same way, I sort of, we had to do this kind of thing of socialization about just sort of simple hygiene around um, malicious software with email. That, you know, we had to sort of like learn what's good for us and what's bad for us. And so I think part of it is, that's something that we have to do. It's not all on the companies. Although I think that there's a lot of sort of this good value that, that business can get from data and from information while not being dicks. But I think that there's a culture of Silicon Valley right now that rewards the Ubers of the world for acting like assholes. Right? Even though they built a fantastic system, a perfect system. They didn't have to act like dicks. They didn't have to treat their employees terribly. They didn't have to create dangerous situations for their riders. But they did, and they really did make more money. So I think that part of the thing is that we have to sort of realize is the people who are designing these systems, building these systems, is don't do it for dicks. <laughs> you know? It's like we, software is ideological. It is political. And I don't mean Republican, Democratic. I mean that it has values built into it. As a, as a UX designer, my job is to shape behavior, hopefully for the good of both parties, the business and the customer. But it is behavior shaping. It's like, how are you going to use that? So you know, it's like we, as the ones building it, have a say. We can vote with our feet if we need to. So I think it's a really important, crucially important moment to realize that our data is not always being used to our benefit. But I think one of the things we can assist as consumers, but certainly as designers and developers, is to make that as transparent as possible. That's a start. I care a lot about that. Yeah. To be the person who started talking, and it was really the person. Um, but anyways, so as you talk about magical user experience and the flexibility of interaction, you're really speaking to one of the primary principles of universal design, which is creating a way in which all people can interact with technology, regardless of disability. But you didn't talk at all about universal design and disability today. So how is it that we weave that kind of conversation into a community like this when we see these fast-moving, you know? Uh, technologies when we're still suing Target for not including alt tags on their images? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. I think that one of the things we're raising next, it's, it's super important. I think that this is, as we get more and more different kind of inputs and outputs, that this is something that is frankly bound to be beneficial to all, because now we have alternative ways into information. That, the, that you know, as much as we've been saying since the dawn of the web, designed so that these things can be read by speech readers. Like you said, we have you know, big companies that don't do that. And yet, when speech becomes a mainstream interface, suddenly it becomes easier to say. I mean, I think we've all been in these situations, probably all done it, and a little bit embarrassed to like, OK, great, well, I understand. We've got to take care of, of the, the people with visual disabilities. But you know, come on, we've got to get the 90% first. And then it just falls off. Right? But now when the 90% can benefit from it too, this is something that, you know, I mean, unfortunately, we're in a situation where often we leave out the minority. It's because of timelines, because, more because of timelines and budgets than because of a lack of care, I think. But I think right now we've got this moment where, by doing speech interface, gestural interface, covering this gamut of ways to get into information that I think is going to be more expressive. But it's something that we have to think about. 
There are, these, there are privacy and surveillance issues that we have to worry about here, but there are also just sort of human issues. You know, what's natural, what's possible? How do we do this without leaving people out? But I think the good news is that we have more ways to reach more people now than ever before. So thank you for bringing up a really important thing for all of us to keep in mind. Yeah, in the back here. Hello. Right you were delightful. Oh, and thank you. You too. Digitally could understand the um, I'm wondering, as technology warms up and is not so cold, and our heads pointing down to a screen, I could barely make it without posting photos, God bless me. Um, is there hope for our fractured attention, do you think, as far as human interactions that are removing this screen compelling sort of nature that yeah, we're in right now? I think so. I'm really optimistic about this. Thanks for asking about that, though. Great question. We're irrevocably lost. Human nature doesn't change. I don't think so either. Yeah. Hooray for human! <laughs> uh, human nature doesn't change in the course of years or even generations. I mean, I think that habits and opportunities do. You know, for, for me, for my generation, this is sort of a slight detour, but I'll bring it back around, is, you know, I was the slacker generation. So when I got out of college, we were the ones who moved immediately back home, didn't do anything, we were the video clerks. And then just a few years later, we were the workaholics of the dot-com generation. And the difference was, frankly, opportunity, right? Is that I graduated from college in the middle of the first Bush recession, and there wasn't much to do, right? But suddenly there was new opportunity as an entirely new industry exploded, that suddenly there was tons to do. And so I think that human nature remains the same, but it follows the track of possibility and opportunity. And the thing that we can do as technologists is to create those sort of patterns of behavior that are that create the world that we want it to be for ourselves and for our kids and for other people too. Right on, thank you. Yeah. Can um, advertising be magic or will it ruin this like it ruins everything else? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, it might surprise you guys, I love advertising. And for a few different reasons. I mean, I think that good advertising, when matched with a real need, can be great storytelling, can be a great, you know, really interesting form. I mean, the thing is that we see a lot of shitty advertising, right? We see it mismatched to time. It's something that's often abused, and it's, it hits us over the head at moments that are inappropriate. Uh, but I think that right now, it's, for example, one of the things that, that pays for this kind of ama amazing content that we have right now. And I don't know what we're going to do. We have to figure out something. If advertising fails on mobile devices, where we're using increasingly over 50% of the time to access content, if that fails as a revenue source, what are we going to do? Because we obviously won't pay for it. You know? <laughs> so I think advertising is super important. And I think that, the, the, that one of the things about data is that it can potentially be used I think with appropriate transparency, you can deliver a good message at a good time. It's all happened to us sometimes. I mean, Amazon.com is pretty good at it, and when I get emails from Amazon, I'll look at them, because it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I should probably buy that. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it can be great. You hear marketers, uh, not all marketers for sure, but they're often the loud ones when we get these new sort of sensor-based, location-based information. Advertising would be great. It's always Starbucks for whatever reason. People are going to be walking by a Starbucks and they can be able to give an alert that there's a discount for a Starbucks coffee. First of all, Starbucks never gives discounts for their coffee, I don't think. Uh, but, you know, nobody wants that. That kind of service where it's just like, I'm adjacent to a buying opportunity. Buy, buy, buy! No, nobody wants that. But I think that there are possibilities when you, we use data thoughtfully that it can be timed in a way like Google Now is for a lot of people, to sort of say, oh, yes, thank you. That is really useful information for a service that I could actually use. For services that nobody could actually use, I mean, sorry, that's going to be sort of an irredeemable advertising experience. But I think, yeah, it can be magical, and a lot of this stuff will go into data, but I think we're not good at it enough yet. So I think that's the area. I think advertising can be a service. It can also be horribly annoying. Yeah. Some of these interfaces are simple, you know, you turn the lock, it opens, we learned how to do that from the Other of these interfaces like voice and language and microexpression on faces are learned human to human over quite a bit of time when our brains are developing. And we're also in the stage now where 
there's so many simulations, right? All, so many things you show are, it's a made up, scripted simulation, right? So where is the, I didn't mean that, I meant this. Yeah, right. Or right. expression or s semantics. What you see every time you talk to Siri, right? It's like, that. no, that's not what I said. <laughs> For sure, right? So like, a lot of the stuff is not yet mature. Like when I sort of said at the very beginning that we're getting more and more ways to talk to um, uh, information interfaces, you know, touch seems soft, right? That's a really mature you know, technology. You can feel speech so close. Natural gesture, it's right around the corner. It's not there yet. You don't want to power a nuclear power plant with Siri or Connect. Right? But part of Connect sort of charm is that it's not quite accurate. You know, it's part of it is sort of trying to figure out how is it going to lead me, right? It's inaccuracy is part of its appeal in a well-designed game and that stuff. So I think that part of it is understanding, like I said, when systems aren't smart enough to do, but always to be forgiving there. Uh, and I think that right now, um, with speech, for example, it's expensive. It's an expensive error. It's the round trip that it takes. Who has a, an Android Wear watch? Wow, nobody, okay. Oh, this one. You know, it's like when you use the speech interface, basically Android Wear has said, don't use the watch interface. It, it, you know, the, the, when they say to app designers, it's basically, don't do any interactions that take more than like three seconds. So it's not supposed to be like a smartphone. It's supposed to be for this very glanceable thing. In fact, they make it really hard to launch an app to request information. They, they know that sort of doing data input through touch is really hard, and you're gonna cover the entire screen with your finger. So the only way to request information is through speech. And you have to talk to it, broadcast the information by Bluetooth to your phone, relays it over mobile, you know, waits, comes back, and then it's wrong. And it's like, it's 40 <laughs> seconds for the wrong thing. Which is this frustrating experience. And so part of the thing is kind of like, you know, maybe it would be better just if it only got notifications in that sense. If we can't, you know, sort of better ask it for information, well, maybe we should wait until we can do it better. Because there's, there's this dangerous, fragile period, right, where if it's terrible, it will just write it off. It will be the Apple Newton. Apple Newton, wow, 10 years ahead of the time, except that it didn't work. Right. And then it ruined it for a long time, and Palm came in, and what, Apple had held on to it. Oh, maybe John Skelly would have kept his job, and we would have forgotten about Steve Jobs. We have time for one more. Come on, last question ever in Mobile Portland. Don't get yeah, it. Yeah, last question ever. No pressure. You guys get your cameras out. Record this one. Oh gosh, this is a big game for Have we, uh, oh, I saw you at an event park a couple of years ago and you had a demo of the magical tapping pants. Yeah. Is, are, has that magical era gone away or are we still have a bright new feature where we can move slides by tapping our, our thigh. He's referring to this thing called drum pants, which is a sensor that goes into your pants and you can like code like different sort of parts of your, your leg to make different musical sounds. Or you can make it talk to your computer so I can, you know, do my slides like that and then go forward, right? Uh, and one of the points that I made in the talk that you're talking about is that is one of those ridiculous examples. That's another one of those mega stomp battles. That's the shark made of. That's just sort of this playful thing of trying to think about what might these things do? And what it's doing, and, and I think and we're really just at the beginning of this era, I think, is letting ourselves make sometimes, sometimes some frankly silly things, splashing puddles, just to find out what's possible. Because one of the things that's great about that, it takes this totally natural interaction that we do all the time, tapping out a rhythm on our, on our leg, and say, so what if we just wired that up to a musical instrument? So much better than all the sort of fake musical instruments that are on the app store that's sort of like doing this. It's like now I'm actually, Man, I'm feeling it. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling it. That's me feeling it. So, <laughs> so I think that we are in this period where we have to sort of let ourselves make some side projects, make some silly experiments, because that's the thing that we're going to do to discover what's hard, and what's easy, and what's maybe useful in a whole other context. But all those things are examples of being like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could just do this thing that I always do and it did the magic thing? Magic pants. <laughs> All right, what a way to end on a... <laughs> it, it seems like there's nothing more appropriate than ending on drum pants. Uh, so thank you Josh for flying out from New York. Please, again, a round of applause for Josh.
everyone for coming to Miller Portland um, on your responsive field day. Um, and I'm assuming there's some drinks happening sometime tonight. So uh, if you're interested in that, we'll probably head over to Rogue. Thank you all. Have a good night. Talk to you later.